This is uh, one of the first uh, in-presence conferences that we're coming back to. Uh, you see that the Italian regulations require uh, people to wear masks. I take it off. Speakers on this side of the thing are allowed to take it off because of the sound quality. But in the inside the building, I think we have to comply with that. So um, just to begin with, ICTP welcomes you. Uh, it's been created uh, by these two people over here in uh, um, 1964. It's been running ever since and uh, sort of improving in, uh, in its uh, goal to bring scientific knowledge uh, <coughs> shared between everybody in the world. It's mostly uh, sponsored by the Italian government, uh, but it is uh, uh, conducted under three agencies and uh, our, in fact, our mother agency is uh, UNESCO at the moment. Uh, coming to our subject of uh, uh, nanotribology, uh, we have been going uh, with it uh, for now maybe uh, uh, 25 years. I think the first one that we had was uh, with Bo Persson, who is here with us today in 1996, I think. <coughs> and we've had a number of them and we uh, hope to continue uh, doing here or elsewhere. In fact, people should consider continuing this uh, kind of activity in other places too. Uh, this uh, meeting is uh, dedicated to the memory of our friend and colleague, Mark Robbins, uh, who has been leaving us uh, unexpectedly uh, two years ago. Uh, some other colleagues here uh, will have to say something about him. Uh, the meeting is directed uh, by uh, uh, three people besides myself. Uh, <coughs> one is Ernst Meyer, who is here with us, uh, University of Basel. University of Basel, who is also providing generous funding for this meeting. We're very grateful for that. Um, the other director is Quan Shui Zheng of <coughs> Tsinghua University, China, who is also sponsoring the meeting. Unfortunately, people uh, cannot come in person from China because of present COVID problems and regulations uh, with quarantine. So we will have uh, him and other people from the institutes in China uh, in remote. The last director is Andrea Vanossi, who did a lot of the work in the planning and things. You will uh, uh, notice that there are problems and gaps in the programs that we shared and everything. This is because uh, Andrea has been out of business in the last few days because of some medical controls he has to take, and therefore some of the updating did not actually uh, take place in automatic uh, very well. Here are uh, our main uh, human resources in terms of uh, helping with this and that and everything. When you have a problem, don't come and ask me because I will just fall, <laughs> fall from the clouds. I, I'll be just lost. Uh, uh, these three uh, people, Ali, who is here, and Andrea. Ali is here. Andrea is where? Out there. And Jin is where? Out there. Right. <coughs> they, uh, they, will be, they will be helping us. And then, of course, we have our three guardian angels. Uh, the guardian angels are just registering us. Victoria is the main one who is on the piece, but uh, uh, Adriana and Monica, too. Uh, they can be reached either by uh, uh, emailing this, uh, this uh, SMR of the conference mm -hmm. uh, or calling this number, this internal 135, or walking up to room 115, two floors, two floors above in case of extreme, extreme need. Um, that, that's the, uh, the, 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 the people that hold all the information and stuff. Now, this is a program uh, that we are, um, uh, that we are uh, facing today. Uh, in, the, in these three and a half days, uh, uh, we have uh, three and a half sessions, as I said. The black uh, uh, symbols here are in presence and the red are in remote. Uh, there's some change here. Uh, Michael Urbach cannot come, and so uh, he will be uh, with us in remote uh, tomorrow. Uh, uh, also, I think uh, Jenkins, who was uh, speaking on, uh, on, on, on Thursday, will also be in remote. Uh, uh, the sessions are divided by these coffee breaks that will take place in this, in this building. Uh, the afternoon, uh, today is not in this building because there is a, a colloquium going on here. So when the 
uh, morning session ends, uh, we will all uh, go down to Adriatico where your accommodation is. Uh, uh, there will be a bus or shuttle taking people down who do not want to walk. One can easily walk down anyway. I think the bus might be at 110 or something to leave some leave space at the end of the sessions. It's very unlikely that we are exactly on time. Um, uh, then we begin in the Adriatico meeting, uh, in the Adriatico meeting room, Castler, uh, this afternoon session. And at the end of the session, we will have posters uh, right outside of the lecture room in Adriatico. And then the reception will take place, hopefully, if it doesn't rain too badly or something, on the terrace in the Adriatico. Anyway, everything this afternoon takes place in the Adriatico. Uh, then, from tomorrow onwards, everything will be in this building. And it will be morning to evening tomorrow. Evening, we have a social dinner, and the rest of the program goes on like this. We will close uh, lunchtime uh, on, the, on, the, on, the, on Thursday. Thursday is the national Italian holiday. This place is international, so it does not go on holiday. <laughs> Uh, but still, uh, you be aware that we are sort of in a, in a holiday uh, kind, of, kind of situation outside of here. So, practicalities. Uh, um, <coughs> speakers are requested to keep a rather strict time, and the chairmen are uh, supposed to uh, take care of that. Allow, please, the 30-minute speakers, five minutes uh, for discussion at the end. Uh, there will be discussion also with people in remote, and that might take a little time, so the five minutes are really needed. The 20-minute 20, the 20 speakers may take three minutes instead. Um, now, there is this, uh, we're working in hybrid, and so there is uh, uh, complications related with that. Uh, please uh, talk to the technical assistants and to the three angels over here uh, uh, about uh, how to how to connect and how to prepare and everything. Uh, if I instruct you, I will confuse you because I don't understand it myself. Uh, uh, <clears throat> but, but this is a, it, it's an important step in order to, to shorten uh, the interval between the speaker and the next. Uh, there will be physical poster sessions, as I said uh, today, at the Adriatico starting six in the afternoon. <clears throat> there will be a prize for best uh, student and, uh, and postdoc posters uh, posted out there. Even people that are speaking, are, uh, uh, they are free, they're welcome to present a poster and, and, and discuss it within, say, one hour time from six to seven with, uh, with uh, the participants in the Adriatico at the same level as the Castler uh, room, which is uh, one floor below, below the entrance. Um, uh, again, speaking about posters, there will be a breakout uh, room session available at the uh, end of the session on Wednesday, 1st of June. That's uh, uh, two days from now. Uh, uh, this would be managed uh, uh, again by, by people who, uh, who arrange these things on the internet. It will be a chance for people to stand beside their poster and explain it uh, to anybody that wants to hear, and people will click on whoever you want to hear from. Uh, it will be a, a, of the order of, I think, uh, 15 or so breakout rooms. We are sorry that we cannot get everyone to speak uh, properly, but that is the best remedy we could find. So uh, this is repeated again. Today only lunch. Lunch today is not in this building. It's uh, down in the Adriatico, so you catch your bus or you walk down, and lunch will be there, not here. <clears throat> and, uh, and then the session continues in the Castler room out there, and the shuttle uh, is already, I already mentioned it. Uh, there will be a welcome reception with food and drinks uh, at the end of uh, today, at the Adriatico thing. I think it should be enough for people to not to have to plan to go for dinner afterwards. Of course, uh, you may like or not like what is going to be provided. It's a free, free for all kind of thing. Uh, <clears throat> all other lunches uh, today, Wednesday and Thursday, are here in this building. There is a cafeteria here at the, uh, at the level, uh, level zero. Uh, so all other lunches will be here. Uh, only today is down at the Adriatico. There's a social dinner on Tuesday uh, uh, evening. Uh, I uh, tentatively wrote registers with secretaries. In fact, I didn't have the time to agree with them about this uh, thing. 
uh, every uh, registered participant is welcome to attend. Um, companions are not included in this, uh, in this invitation. If companions come, they will have to cover their own, uh, their own uh, co uh, cost of dinner. That's required by the UNESCO rules. Uh, the restaurant is in town. It's called Monte Carlo. I hope it's not as chancy as the name <laughs> <laughs> suggests. <laughs> um, uh, last time, last experience we had with Ernst and, and colleagues was very good. I hope it will uh, be similar this time. It's fish menu. I guess people that are vegetarian or have uh, uh, dietary problems should point it out uh, when we arrive there so that they don't get the wrong food. Uh, the three angel secretaries will uh, have accepted the invitation to join us, so maybe I will ask them to interview people about uh, any special uh, needs that they might, they might have. And this is uh, coming to the end of practicalities. Uh, it's, uh, uh, there are, there's a list of chairmen here, um, uh, um, so people that have agreed uh, with Andrea Vanossi, I think Rob has agreed for this afternoon, uh, Lars uh, agreed, uh, I think, with, uh, with Annalisa Fasolino for, uh, for tomorrow morning. Annalisa herself uh, will arrive this afternoon. Annalisa is retired and not active, but she's uh, coming to help us, and we're very, very glad of, of, this, of this opportunity. Ernst, uh, it will be on Wednesday morning, uh, uh, Roland, uh, on, on Wednesday afternoon. And I haven't found a substitute for uh, Michael, Michael Urbach, who was supposed to close. Uh, we will may maybe we'll find one. Now, the shuttle hours. Uh, uh, today, <coughs> I think there was a, a mistake somewhere in the planning. Um, I think uh, uh, the, the bus will come in such a way, I believe, so that you can get your breakfast down at the Adriatico. Mm -hmm. um, now, <coughs> The, the other shuttles are from here to down. It's 1.10 today, uh, eight, uh, 6.30 tomorrow, and, 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 seven, and 7 on Wednesday. Uh, the breakout room might take a little longer than planned, and we have nothing, nothing planned after that. So with this, I think uh, I've uh, finished with this long, this long uh, um, kind of information session, and I quit and I give the word to the first speaker of this morning, who's uh, Rob Karkip here. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Ario, and thank you to all of you for being here. It's wonderful to see people in person for a meeting. It's terrific. Um, <clears throat> let me... I'm set up here. There, okay, I see you can see it, and I hope the people online can see it. Um, so thank you for joining, and again, thank you for the invitation. What's that? The, the screen's not being shared? I think it's, if it's up here, it's being shared, because I'm not, I know I'm not connected to the, any other hardware. Okay, no, but good to check. <laughs> Double checking is good. Uh, thank you. So yeah, again, thank you to the organizers. To Andrea is not here. Uh, Ariel, Quanchi, Ernst. Um, it's really an honor to be here. Uh, and uh, I was asked to uh, say a couple words uh, uh, as the opening speaker about Mark Robbins. I uh, was very fortunate to get to know Mark uh, over the years. He was located in Baltimore at Johns Hopkins University, which is not too far from Philadelphia, and he actually spent a sabbatical at my university uh, with some people in physics. So I'm very lucky that I had many interactions with him over the years. Uh, I uh, was just reflecting on the different times that I had seen him, uh, and one of them was here uh, at the 2011 meeting uh, uh, that was a joint ICTP FANIS meeting. Uh, that Ario, Andrea, Nicola, and Ogus were, were co-organizers of. And I, I didn't remember this until starting to look through some old photographs. Uh, there was an excursion to this Castello de Miramare during the meeting, which was absolutely beautiful location and a be beautiful weather that day. Uh, and just another, you know, one example of how the meetings here are so excellent scientifically and aesthetically, uh, it's such a pleasure. And I, I found this uh, photograph, in fact, that was taken there of uh, 
Mark, who you can recognize. Does anybody recognize who the other person is? This would be, this would be Lars. Uh, I think um, what's amazing is, uh, Mark, you know, this is what Mark looked like. He, he even, you know, the, uh, many years later, he, he seemed to stop aging. Uh, um, and uh, I don't know, Lars, if we can say the same thing uh, about you. But, um, but what I like about this photograph is you see the, the smile, the famous smile that Mark always had. And uh, I think it was just a reflection of how genuinely joyful he always was about science, but also about people and interacting with people and being in different places and working with, whether it was students, collaborators, um, asking questions at conferences. Um, there, there was this, this true uh, joy there that he had and that he brought to everyone else's uh, 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 throughout, through, through his interactions. He, he also would have that same smile when he would ask very, very difficult, challenging questions as well. Uh, and uh, being on the receiving end of those sometimes, I, I remember that uh, the smile was a double-edged sword. But, but Mark always had the ability to, to ask penetrating questions in his research, in interactions with him, to get to the bottom of what the physics, the physical uh, interactions were that, that we were trying to understand in, in friction, but also many other problems in nonlinear, non-equilibrium statistical physics that he tackled over the years. Um, and I thought that uh, there's so much that he's done. There are some ways, I think, to remember and honor him um, and to continue to learn from him because uh, fortunately we, we live in an age now where there are many things captured on video and on the internet. Um, and as well, uh, uh, special uh, opportunities. So for those of you who will be attending the World Tribology Congress uh, this July in Lyon, there will be a special session um, in his honor. Um, and uh, uh, I invite you to uh, please attend. It's part of track six, which is the track on multi-scale, multi-physics modeling and experiments. So very appropriate for, uh, for one that honors Mark. Um, and then I'm gonna show you a few other links you might be interested in, and, and I will, well, this is being recorded, but also share this with the organizers so we can email it out to people. Um, in case you didn't know, uh, Martin Muser guest edited a special issue of Tribology Letters uh, that came out in May of 2021, and there's just a, a set of excellent articles there, as well as a beautiful tribute that, that Martin wrote uh, about Mark and his life. And there's some interesting things online. Uh, Mark organized this Kavli Institute for Theoretical Physics meeting back in 2005 that was focused on, from, it was called From the Atomic to the Tectonic, Friction, Fracture, and Earthquake Physics. And as part of that, at this institute, which it, it's sort of like the ICTP of, of America because it's, it's, uh, it's also on the coast. It's in Santa Barbara, California, with a beautiful view of the ocean. And, um, they record all of the presentations, including these blackboard talks. So this is a talk that Mark gives about friction with no slides. It's entirely done on the, with a piece of chalk uh, on the blackboard, and, and you can watch that. Um, and, uh, and it's interesting. And you, you can see here he's drawing some uh, jagged surface, uh, talking about friction coefficient, dealing with the angle. You can see it. Here's, a, here's, a, here's Coulomb, Coulomb. Here's Amonton's law right there. And as well, there is a, a recording of a lecture he gave more recently in 2017, also on contact and friction um, from microscopic to macroscopic scales. And so that is also available free online. So for those of us who knew him well, it's, 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 you know, it's enjoyable to watch. And for those of you younger people who may not have had the chance to know Mark and his speaking style and his research, um, I encourage you to check these links out uh, because uh, you'll, you will learn a lot from them. Uh, Mark would encourage you uh, to come to the Gordon Conference on Tribology. Um, Mark was the chair of this meeting uh, a few years back. Uh, the current chair is Judith Harrison and Song Kim is the vice chair, and I agreed to help them promote the meeting. The, uh, there's a pre-conference for students, postdocs, young researchers on uh, uh, the Sunday, Saturday, Sunday before, and then the week of, starting Sunday night, is the conference. And although the deadline for applying was officially May 29th, actually they are still accepting applications. Um, so it is in person after being on hiatus, uh, and I encourage uh, those who are interested to please submit an application 
to attend as soon as possible. It's a unique um, meeting that is very enjoyable. So I'm coming back to this, but I'm gonna grab my water. My, my dry throat is not from COVID. <laughs> I had, uh, in fact, I took a test before uh, last night to make sure. So with all the travel, there's always this fear. But I want to spend the, the, the time I have telling you about some research that I've done in collaboration with Ashley Martini, who's going to be speaking later today. Uh, most of this, actually all of the experimental work was done by my former student, Catherine Haas, who's about to become a professor at Carthage College in Wisconsin. Uh, and Ashley's student, Mohammed Vaziri Sharesh, who's now at LAM Research, did all the simulation work that you're going to see. And this is uh, what we've been focusing on over the past several years are 2D materials and layered materials. I think this audience needs no introduction to the importance of these, which come in bulk form, uh, they come in thin film form, they come in monolayer form. The low, the easy shear between the layers, of course, leads to low friction and this has allowed them to be incredibly successful as, uh, as uh, solid lubricants. Um, you can buy them, you just put them on dry, you can grow them as thin films, you can spray them on a surface in a suspension, um, you can uh, make them additives as particles inside of lubricants, and they can help to reduce friction and prevent wear. And one of the reasons why I think there's a lot of excitement uh, about these is because in addition to having low friction, and low adhesion, you can control the friction and adhesion. You can, it's hard to get high friction to be low, but if you're starting with low friction, you can often do things to bring it up. And so if you think about flexible electronics, um, these, there are many opportunities to take advantage of the amazing electronic and thermal and optical properties of 2D materials while also taking advantage of how flexible they are. But to assemble and manufacture these, you need to often to adhere or de-adhere or transfer different layers. Um, as you bend it, you may get sliding, small amounts of sliding and shear stress between the layers. So the, the tribology is important for the electronic applications that integrate these materials. And as you may or may not know, uh, moly disulfide in particular, that is the solid lubricant of choice for, for space. And we can thank, we can be thankful to moly disulfide uh, for uh, helping the James Webb Space Telescope succeed the moving bearings, gears, and other uh, components that are exposed to the space environment have a, a, a molybdenum and sulfur-containing thin film coating on those parts, and that is the key uh, to ensuring that they don't seize up in the low temperature, low vacuum environment of space. Um, so we depend on these uh, every day, including for some very remarkable applications. So over the last several years, we have been looking at um, how small nanoscale tips, AFM tips, interact with uh, 2D materials. Usually we are looking at them exfoliated onto a surface, maybe grown by CVD. Um, we have worked with uh, a few different researchers, but we, we have, have a, a very close relationship with Professor Charlie Johnson at the University of Pennsylvania who grows 2D materials in novel and innovative ways and makes devices out of them. Um, these are some monolayer graphene islands that he grew using CVD which we looked at, this is now 10 years ago or so, but I really like this example because what we've got is a copper surface and then just monolayer of graphene on top, and this is a friction force map. And you can see as you slide across, uh, you get an order of magnitude reduction in the friction between the copper, it's really, there's some oxide on the surface, so oxide surface, high friction, graphene, uh, extremely low in the limit of what, you know, this AFM can detect, you know, a couple nanonewtons of, of force, um, so this is impressive, a single layer of carbon atoms interposed between a tip and a substrate is all you need to reduce friction by an order of magnitude or, or better. And not only that, this is quite uh, uh, robust over lo uh, different loads. So this is the friction force versus normal force for the copper. Uh, you can see it's up here and it keeps increasing uh, down with the graphene. Uh, it's much, not only are the forces lower, but there's almost no slope almost no increase in the friction force with, with load, which is something that always surprises me because I keep expecting, well, if you push harder, the contact area goes up, shouldn't you see more friction? Um, but the friction coefficient uh, is almost vanishing, um, uh, indis statistically indistinguishable from zero uh, for this material. That's been seen on graphite uh, before by many others, and, and we also see it on graphene. 
So uh, right away, just that's one example of how you can uh, have a strong effect on friction force and friction coefficient um, through this single layer of, uh, of graphene. Now, when we slide on these crystals, even though it's a single layer thick, if it's ordered, we often see stick-slip friction, uh, which I think uh, many uh, here are very familiar with ways to describe periodic stick-slip friction using things like the parental tomlinson model, where you take a rigid potential, uh, reduce all the, order, all the degrees of freedom of the, tip, of the tip to a single point particle, an atom as it were, connect it to a spring, and there's some energy corrugation to that potential energy surface. There's some spacing of the lattice, and Prantl and Tomlinson each uh, worked out that you can get these instabilities uh, as you slide, so as you pull, the little energy minimum you're in gets shallower and shallower until it disappears, at which point you'll slip to the next position, and that's at zero temperature. Of course, at finite temperature, thermal excitations will help you slip even earlier than that, and uh, Enrico and Roland Benowitz in the audience are people that helped figure out the right way to, uh, uh, to describe that uh, early on. So um, the key parameters in getting the static friction force out of this model is the corrugation of the potential energy surface, this delta E, and the lattice spacing actually comes in uh, here as well. So uh, this is a very simple relation. This is, again, zero temperature. Uh, there are speed effects, temperature effects, but, but a very simple relation. And this is what I want to focus on, is what is it that determines this energy barrier? Um, and what happens as you change the conditions? And in particular, uh, what, to what extent does the force you measure depend on how big an area of contact you have? Um, or how much does it depend on the frictional shear strength, the force per unit area that you have in the single asperity? And you can sort of somewhat crudely, uh, but I think still meaningfully, divide, divide these two uh, quantities, the shear strength and the contact area, into two concepts. The, the shear strength is like the quality of the contact. If you have more interfacial bonds, if you have um, uh, a commensurate interface, uh, if you have maybe uh, contaminants, that can give you higher force per unit area. But also, if you have just more atoms in contact, each one of those, uh, interfa each one of those interfacial uh, atoms is pairing with something across the surface, and that can increase friction, just elastic deformation, plastic deformation. Separating these out, I think, is important. If we think about qu contact quality, it was actually Mark Robbins and Martin Muser uh, who really first pointed out that you know, in a commensurate, sur commensurate surfaces can have high friction, incommensurate would have low friction, why do we not see vanishing friction all the time? Interfaces shouldn't normally uh, just suddenly be commensurate. Well, for one thing, contaminant atoms will pin uh, the interface. So even an incommensurate surface can have high friction, and this concept is over 20 years old now. Um, Mark also showed another way to think about what happens at the interface. Take the same tip, the same radius, but make it round, make, make it like a bent crystal, make it an amorphous structure, make it a stepped structure and the contact stresses that you get are completely different down at the nanoscale. So, and friction will be different uh, at this scale. So, these are just some examples to say that uh, the quantity of the contact matters, but the quality matters too, how the atoms are inter interacting across that interface, how they are structured. And that's gonna be the theme of this talk. So, um, I, I wanted to show three examples. I think I will only have time for two, and that's okay, because this last one, you will hear about this afternoon uh, when Ashley Martini gives her talk. So I'm gonna focus on how humidity affects friction. In this case, it's gonna be for graphite. Um, and then how orientation uh, is affected in the, in the case of friction and isotropy. So first for humidity, um, we measure friction as a function of uh, the humidity at a, a fixed load. I'm gonna show you data at three different speeds. There was not a, a strong speed dependence. We measure friction with um, uh, tips uh, on, on graphite. Friction's very low on graphite when it's dry. As we raise the humidity, we see an increase in friction. Okay. This is not too surprising. Many people have seen you start letting humidity in, you get often a capillary that will form. That capillary will create an adhesive force between the tip and the sample that will increase the contact area. Right? It's, just, it's like you're adding load to the system because this capillary 
has surface tension, it has a Laplace pressure, it increases the load, you get higher friction. But then this happens, uh, it turns over. As you go to very high humidities, closer to saturation, the friction comes down again. This has been seen with adhesion measurements on various surfaces in many cases, and this actually also is still consistent with the capillary model. When you have a capillary and you get to near saturation, the larger the capillary, um, the, the less uh, the curvature is. Very high curvature leads to a high uh, Laplace pressure. If it's not very curved, you don't have that much of a Laplace pressure. And, and if it's just flooded, if it's 100%, if you're just underwater, there's no capillary anymore at all. So the effect of the adhesion goes down. So this actually tracks with what a full-blown theory for a tip on a surface, what kind of adhesion you would get. And we thought, oh, okay, this is what we're seeing. Capillary forms, and then it floods, and friction goes up and down. Ashley's group did molecular dynamic simulations using a Grand Canal Monte Carlo scheme where they could vary the, par the partial pressure of the water, so tip, sample, and then water molecules um, that were simulated, and they also saw um, a maximum in the friction response uh, for their simulations. So we said, okay, it looks good, but is it really the mechanism or is there anything else going on? You know, do we really see that the contact area goes up because the capillary forms and causes adhesion? That's this idea. Well, they can get the contact area between the tip and sample. It was not increasing. They saw negligible, no, no significant change in the contact area. And furthermore, if there was adhesion, you would expect there to be elastic deformation as the tip and sample are pulled together by that capillary. And so the vertical distance between a reference point on the tip and sample should decrease. But actually, it increased a tiny amount, only one angstrom net. But they can resolve it. And outside of the noise of their simulations, there's a clear increase in the height of the tip, not decrease as the relative humidity goes up. So something else is going on. The contact area model, this adhesion model of, of, of why friction changes with relative humidity doesn't, doesn't work. The fact that um, it goes up, the height increases, that gave us a hint that actually there must be water molecules in between the tip and sample, and this is having an effect. And this made us think about Mark's work. You put contaminants at an interface, it can cause friction to go up. So we said, okay, let's take a look at what the registry is between the adsorbed water molecules and the substrate, as well as the tip. So um, there's this very useful uh, concept that Oded Had uh, 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 came up with the registry index. When a adsorbate, or, or an, it could be an adsorbate, it could be an atom on the other surface, if it is at a favorable site, we say that's a low energy interaction that's got a low registry index, and you normalize that to zero. Uh, if it's an energetically uh, unfavorable site, the maximum, most unfavorable site, in this case, right on top of a carbon instead of in the hollow sites, uh, we give that an energy index of one, okay? So uh, uh, a low registry index is telling you favorable uh, interactions and thus possible pinning uh, of the interface. So what I'm showing you here are side views that I showed before, the tip sample and the, the water uh, molecules in the simulation in blue. And then this is a top view. You can see the graphite lattice. And then the atoms that I'm showing here are the, are the water uh, molecules. This is actually a coarse-grained model. So um, there's just a single bump for each water. Uh, and I can talk about that potential more if you like, but it, it actually does a reasonable job of modeling a lot of physics of water. So at low humidity, there's very few of these adsorbates, and, uh, but they are there. As you keep increasing, well, and you can see the, the red would be that they're sitting in unfavorable sites, the green would be sitting in favorable sites. Okay? Now, why are so many of them in unfavorable sites? Well, some of them are interacting with the tip as well. Okay. So they're finding a balance, but in terms of their registry with the graphite, not too many of them are very favorable. As you add more water, you start seeing um, that there are more adsorbates total, and you see that there are more green atoms, one that are more favorable in terms of being pinned, being low energy, and thus more difficult to take out of that site. And, and then as we go to very high humidities, 
you can see what looks like a capillary, and you see many of these, many more of these atoms are indeed in energetically favorable sites. So what we can do is come up with what we call an effective pinning parameter. So, so first, uh, this is a plot versus relative humidity of the registry index in red, and we, we do it as we, this is again in the simulation as the humidity goes up, as the humidity goes down, so ramping up, ramping down, just to check for hysteresis, there's a little bit, but the key point is, we see that the registry index is high at first, so lots of unfavorable sites, then more favorable pinning, and then finally at the highest humidity, the registry index goes back up, okay? The water is no longer in very many favorable sites. So we define an effective pinning as the number of atoms, uh, the number of pinned atoms times one minus the registry index, right? That makes a low registry index give us high uh, effective pinning, as it should. And so, okay, we see a max. We see a maximum around 80, and that's close to where we see the maximum in the friction in the simulations and, and, and in the experiments, a little bit higher than in the experiments. But this is saying it looks like the pinning of those water molecules at the interface is important, okay? So more pinning sites, and we get um, higher friction. What is happening here that's bringing it down? This is um, depinning. The water molecules, as you can see here, once you get to high humidities, 80, 100%, they start aligning with each other. You have lateral ordering of the water at the interface instead of being disordered. And that gives you now an, essentially an incommensurate layer. Those lateral interactions between the water molecules allow it to uh, create a layer that is now incommensurate with the graphene and allows easier, and with the tip, and allows easier shearing. So uh, I'm going to skip this, but I will say er, Michael Erbach and Astrid DeWine had a general, have a general model that saw something very similar, friction versus coverage of uh, generic adsorbates that is consistent with this idea. So we see that with this amorphous uh, tip and a graphite surface, the pinning of water molecules, in other words, this contact quality, uh, leads to higher friction. Um, low friction with few adsorbates, pinning sites at intermediate humidities, but at high humidities, the layer depends because of the lateral interactions as the water forms an ordered layer, okay? Um, and this contrasts with that meniscus idea, that capillary idea I mentioned, but is consistent with, uh, with the work of Michael and Astrid. Um, I think I'm down to probably time to, time to wrap up. I will say, I, I haven't talked about orientation, that's okay, uh, but I, I will be happy to talk with you about uh, these topics, and you will hear more about them when Ashley gives her talk this afternoon. And so with that, I will uh, thank you very much and be happy to take your questions. At, at what loads were these um, uh, experiments and simulations performed? Right. So uh, we typically did, yeah, so the uh, experiments were done with zero applied load, but there was always some adhesion, and that adhesion had some variation with humidity. So we just had the adhesive load, uh, the adhesive forces, the load, effectively. I believe those values were around five to 10 nanonewtons, I would have to check that. We have that in, in this paper. Um, the simulations, we uh, tried to essentially match that, but uh, the simulations, the tip is quite a bit smaller than what we had in the experiments. So, uh, so a, a, I think a word of caution is that the, 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 the mean stresses are, the loads are similar between the simulations, the experiments, but the mean stresses are different. They're higher in the case of the simulations. Is it's graphene, right? The substrate. It was actually graphite. We had some uh, experience on graphene and saw a similar trend as well. We did not see a major difference between, we could not resolve a difference between graphene and graphite for humidity. It's quite easy to break these hydration layers. It's rather easy to break the hydration layers. And, yes. Uh, um, yeah, so, and also then the coarse grading model uh, it's really tricky to get the f uh, ordered water um, 
to describe this ordering process uh, in the force grading models, perhaps? Yeah, this is the, it's the MW molecular water uh, potential, and maybe I'd be happy to talk to you afterwards, and I, we agree there, there's limitations, but we think that the consistency between the simulations and experiments is, is encouraging, but I, you know, there's, there's much more one can do. Thanks for an interesting talk. I was uh, wondering, a few years ago there was this controversy about when graphene becomes graphite and multi-layer graphene, and, and can you just make a, a comment about that, when graphene becomes actually graphite? So, Psychologically I speaking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, th I think that's fairly well defined from an electronic structure uh, standpoint. We have lots of data and first principles calculations where it takes so many layers before the electronic properties become bulk-like, and I believe it becomes negligible after something like eight or 10. Um, people can correct me if I'm wrong. But uh, from a friction standpoint, we've seen that um, friction go starts going up as you, the number of layers goes down. So with about four layers of graphene, it's indistinguishable from the bulk. With three, two, one, the friction goes up. And that is, uh, an ongoing issue, we think that it's largely due to the quality of the contact. The graphene, the thinner the graphene, the more flexible it is, the easier it is for it to find favorable interactions with the tip, um, and, uh, and the friction goes up. But we think there's even more to the story than that. So, so from a friction standpoint, you need four layers. Hi. Um, you've uh, pointed out very nicely that the radius of the simulations is a lot smaller yeah. than most of the experiments. Yeah. And of course, most of the old explanations in terms of um, capillary and so forth are based on quasi-fluid continuum. What hope is there of bridging that scaling gap yet? Jim Bellack tried to have multi-million atom simulations. Uh -huh. Where are we? Right, right. I think that um, there's been a lot of development and advances in the fidelity of um, potentials that describe water and improvements in, in, of course, in the first principles methods and being able to simulate somewhat larger things. Um, and what I see in the literature, and I'm not an expert on water you know, modeling, but uh, there's still some ha harsh debate <laughs> between different adherence to different uh, potentials. That said, uh, there are more and more examples of simulations that really do uh, faithfully reproduce uh, experimental results and, um, and, that the, and that they do it down to small scale. So I think we're, we're better off, but the, the debates continue. Yeah, so if, if you want to ask a question, you can unmute yourself and ask, or also I will see if I can find it in the chat. I don't see anything in the chat, though. Ah, I see a raised hand from Jermaine Kenmore. Kenmo. So Jermaine, if you can unmute yourself, I'm happy to take your question. Yes, uh, thank you, Professor Carpin, for a nice presentation. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, thank you. So I, I, I saw your paper, uh, Physical Review Material, uh, 2019. I, I want to know how can we uh, model uh, uh, in a print transition model, simple print transition model, the, the humidity uh, in the model. Can you, say, can you say something about it? Oh, how is the humidity controlled in the model? Yes, yes, a, a simple uh, quantum Nissan model. Or if you have any reference on this model, uh, can you uh, tell me something about it? So the way it was done in the molecular dynamic simulations was um, using the, the LAMPS uh, framework um, for running the uh, simulation, and the potential was this so-called MW molecular water potential, which we, we cite in the paper. and. Um, it's a grand canonical Monte Carlo simulation. So what that means is you allow the number of uh, water molecules to vary um, and reach a, uh, a steady state uh, 
you know, equ an equilibrium value at each of the different humidities. Um, so, uh, uh, and that's a fairly well established uh, uh, method. Um, and Ashley will be here this afternoon and can answer more about that. Um, and also we, we have the details in the paper, but essentially the, it's all through molecular dynamics. We do not um, have a way to uh, essentially describe this in a reduced order model. I think I heard you say Prandtl Tomlinson. I don't see any way that, uh, there's no simple uh, way to accommodate that. You could make arguments about, okay, maybe it changes the energy barrier, the potential energy barrier, but I think this would be complex. Last question, Rob. Uh, the thank water, you so much. Okay. Right. Welcome. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, the, the water could get, uh, could the water get in between the first oh. layer and the second layer and do something else? Good question. So uh, uh, I think in, in the experiment, since we were working with graphite in the uh, experiments uh, and the graphene in the simulations was um, large and covering the whole surface, there wasn't an easy opportunity for that. But if you had defects or edges, water can intercalate uh, between graphene uh, and substrates or between the different layers of graphite. So it is possible. Um, we didn't see evidence of that, but it's something worth looking for. Yeah. I think that was a very good session. Thank you very much. Thank you.